My name is Craig Bedell. I was asked by Jeff um, to come here and do a presentation. Uh, based on my knowledge, a lot of people don't know uh, who I am, but um, I've been derbying for 38 years. Um, won pretty much everywhere in the country. And last year we won Bash for Cash, which doesn't seem like a lot to most people, but that was the one that I wanted to win. Um, in 2019, I actually quit racing cars and came back into full-time derby. Um, a gentleman uh, by the name of Kelly Fredders builds cars and has people drive, and he asked me to drive. And in four years, we won over 100 derbies. So it's a little, little statement out there, but uh, I'm not standing here to tell you that I'm the best. Um, you can be beaten on any day. There's just a lot of things that add up to keys and um, why you are there at the end every time. It's not about soft driving. Um, I ran a car wide open from the beginning and still got to the end. It's about your mechanical abilities, your welding abilities, and your track awareness. Um, everyone, biggest question for compacts, you can put too big a bumper on. It's false. If I'm going to build a car where they allow plates down the side of the frame rail, we're going to put a big bumper on because it's going to keep the frame rails together. It's going to roll evenly, um, but you have to have that plate down the side to help hold that on. If you're only allowed a plate on the front of the frame rail capping it and you put a too heavy a bumper on, it will break off. You're, you're welding to tin and there's not a welder in the country that's figured out how to make that stay together. So know your build, know, know your rules is where we start. Um, Got to jump into that safety issue that Jeff um, talked about earlier. Safety is your number one key. If you get knocked out, you bang an elbow inside that car, it takes you a couple minutes to recover. Somebody's going to whack you in a wheel. You have, to, you have to be comfortable in your car. You have to be secure in your car. In a compact, the seats aren't that good. Um, I strongly suggest not only running a strap, but putting a plate off your cage with a simple piece of tubing from the cage to a plate on the back of the seat. Um, we've been doing that for years and never broke a seat yet. Um, door plates, I wouldn't run a car without one. And everyone's like, oh, it's a lot of steel, it's a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of money to go to the hospital and get stitches in your elbow too. Um, with the bumpers that we're allowed to run, you can protrude through somebody's door very easily. Um, there's a bunch of padding that needs to be in place around your head. In a compact car, there's not as much room as a full-size car. You will get bounced around pretty heavily. So those are key things that you need to do is be safe. Um, nobody's ever laughed at me after I got out of the car from winning with a wrist brace and elbow pad and knee pads on. I, I don't care what I look like in the end of the day when I get out and can climb in another car and they can't, that's, they can laugh all they want. Um, how many people in here loop a car and have their radiator hoses blow off? It's because you're running regular clamps. Does anyone know what a, a diesel truck has for clamps for around the turbo? They're a steel clamp, stainless steel most times with a bolt through them. Strongly suggest you get on the internet and uh, on eBay, Amazon, anything and order these clamps. I'd run them on everything. My wife's car that I drove here has them on it. I'm a mechanic by trade, I own a body shop and uh, every car that we have to put a clamp on gets those clamps. The stainless steel screw clamps, you over tighten them, you under tighten them. There's a torque for those things and people don't realize if you over torque them and they strip out, they will blow off as soon as it comes to pressure. So that's the reason you're losing your hose clamp or your hoses is because the clamps are over tightened. Um, I don't know that torque spec. I don't worry about it. I don't run those clamps. Um, Another big thing that we try to uh, emphasize on is that if you're going to run a Camry 
make sure all your Camry stuff is the same throughout your builds. Um, we basically take our engines and get them set up so that they all just drop in. Nothing, this motor doesn't have this set up and that one doesn't have that set up. Everything's the same. So that way you're not mix matching stuff. Um, you really have to know what you want to get into, what your class is you're building for. All my motors and transmissions that come out of, it doesn't matter if it's a mod compact or a, a wire class compact, if I'm changing a motor, that motor will go in anything that it's going in. It's all simplified down. Um, I'm not biased against any products that are out there. I use um, Fab Farm products because that's what I started with. Um, and they're, they're basic and they're simple and they're what work for me. Find what works for you is the easiest way. But uh, the other thing is don't believe everything you read on the internet because I've seen so many people say, oh, that looks cool. We'll show up to the Derby. I think it looks cool too. But they overbuilt their car and watch how it bends. Um, for years, I still do it right now. I have not changed the way we notch the back of a car. I notch the back of a car with a torch, cut it wide open. People look at it and they say, hey, that's weak. Okay, it is for about three minutes. Once it folds in, it'll be real nice and hard. Those compacts don't mean anything when that back end's sticking out there three, four foot. It's when it rolls in, and if you can get it to roll in and be square, it will be tough. Um, the creasing and stuff, I don't do it just because I don't have time. It, it, it is, it's, it's gonna strengthen it. Um, I never worried about it. I like, what I run personally is just uh, mod stuff mainly, and we just get the back end to roll in and get against that cage. Once it's against that cage, it's not going anywhere. Um, as far as wire compacts, when you're doing your back ends, you gotta cut those a little bit more. Um, don't be afraid to cut them. That frame rail can break off and as long as that metal is back there, it's still gonna do its job. The biggest thing is, is keeping your back end as tight as possible. So if you're allowed to in a wire compact, um, crease your quarters or tuck your trunk, you're gonna wanna do those things to keep it folding into a ball and compact. Um, as far as suspension goes, um, there's built struts out there, there's all these different things you can do, but at the end of the day, what do you wanna break? I'd rather bend a strut than I would break a spindle. And if your rules don't allow you spindle savers, it's going to happen. No matter how soft or hard you run it. The biggest thing is, is knowing what rule set you wanna go with and how rough your track is. Um, you can basically take a strut apart and just slide the bump cushions from another set of struts on there and take up the space, which will help you get ride height and will stop the car from going all, collapsing all the way down onto the wheels. As they bend, it will help, um, being that it can r have higher ride height. Um, if your rules don't allow you to alter your suspension, you can simply go buy a basketball at the store and stick it up in the coil spring and pump the basketball up. It, it'll hold the ride height forever. Um, Make sure you don't have rotted struts if you do do that, because it will break the plates. But um, is there any questions for anything that you'd like me to uh, answer as far as, I, I could sit here all day and tell you, put a plate here, put a plate there. I don't know your rules. If I don't know your rules, I'm not gonna be able to help you with things like that. Um, certain rules, if you put a plate in a place, it, it will bend and alter in another place. So we, I, don't, I don't even want to get into like a, pl a plate placement or, um, you know, ways to alter the way the subframe bends. It, it, there's too much out there for that. Um, if you had questions, you could always ask me. Um, based on your rules, I'm pr pretty sure we've probably tried it. Um, I've wrecked probably 200 Camrys, so. There's definitely a lot of stuff that does work and doesn't work. Um, w body people, I, I've got a lot of knowledge on that too. I actually just quit running them because Camrys are easier. Um, Hyundai's will be the next new Camry when they run out of Camrys. 
So, a little hint for the wise. Um, cut your cars back as short as you can. That helps. All wire cars, I mean, most wire classes allow you to cut them at the core support as well. They don't make you run them stock. I'd cut it as far back as you can. That thing's hard once it gets shorter. Um, I see two people sitting in here right now that I've taught a lot of stupid comments at the derby track just standing there talking that um, they help, don't they? It's the common little things that people don't think of. Um, what do you, you guys have any questions? Oh. Anyone else? Anyone got any questions? Um, rear suspension, everyone says, oh, how do you keep the rear wheels under a car once it gets bent? Well, we the first thing I do on all cars, as far as compact, doesn't matter if it's W body, Camry, I, it doesn't matter what car I get in. Um, We've tried this a lot of times. My county fair is a mile up the road from my house, so I've taken cars up there and just done stupid things to make stuff bend. Um, I pull the front, I pull the rear tires forward as far as I can without getting them to rub right off the bat. Because when they're back all the way, obviously all that tin's coming in, it's gonna hit the tires. When they're sucked forward, you can pull them all the way forward by shortening the trailing arms up and getting them close to that body, now that back end can bend so much farther. We actually will take and bend the front dog leg forward and then get them even farther forward. They're practically rubbing on all my cars when I leave the shop. Stock, mod, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just it's one way to keep the rear wheels on. Don't let them hit them. Um, once that tin's not rubbing, you can get around so much better. Um, big question that everyone asks, do you weld your transmissions? Absolutely. Doesn't work for you, does for me. Um, if you're going to weld your transmissions, you need to make sure that you have good axles. When I say that, you mean you need to take these axles apart, get the grease out of them, put a little dimple weld in them so that those ball bearings won't pull out because that's all that happens to them. They are breaking. Those axles do not break unless you're jumping and hopping down the track, then you'll shear an axle. But as far as when these axles are breaking, people are like, oh, I welded my transmission, the axle went out. The axle didn't go out. What happened is you overturned the car because they hydro steer to the left instantly as soon as that thing's put in gear because all the torque goes to the short side. And when that happens, it over rotates the cups and pulls them out. And once it pulls out, then obviously it spins in there and then we all try to keep going even though we're not going to. But with a welded differential, if I break an axle or I get hit in a wheel and it folds it over, hopefully it will break an axle and I have one wheel peel still. I can still get around. I've won more derbies on one wheel drive because I welded my transmission than I probably have with them both being good at the end. Um, when you're putting your car together, the first measurement that I would do is measure the strut towers. Side to side, from bolt hole to bolt hole, find a spot that you feel comfortable where you know the measurement. I'm not gonna tell you what the measurement is because they're all, I've had different ones. Know that that car's measurement is whatever it is. Find your measurement point because that way when you wreck it or somebody hits you in the side and laces that thing over, you're not throwing a car away because you can't keep an axle in it. You go to that next derby thinking, oh, I just put an axle in that car, I'm fine. Craig said if I weld my transmission and I do all this, I'm fine. You're not gonna be fine. If those strut towers are not in the right location or you shim them axles to the right tolerance, which Toyota, GM, none of them have a tolerance setting. It's what you feel comfortable. If that axle can't move and it's too tight, it will break. So if you bend them axle or them strut towers and they're not in the right location and you have too much play on that axle, of course it's gonna pull out. If they get bent in and it tightens them axles up, now they're gonna break. So I always check the measurement on my struts. I always check the free play in the axle and know what you have. 
Those are the things that people don't think of. They'll build these really nice cars. They'll go out there, they'll get hit one time. They'll try to take it home, they'll fix it. And they'll come and then they'll do it again. First, second guy out. I, every car that I take to the derby track, I don't care if I just won with it or I'm freshly building it. I measure those things because I don't want to be that guy with the axle laying on the track. I didn't drive four or five hours to dump the transmission because the axle was too tight. I have been there, done that. One of the reasons your transmission overheats at times is because your axles are too tight in there and th none of those bearings in there have time to cool down because they've got tension against them. If somebody grabs you by the arm, can you run very fast? It doesn't happen. It's the same thing for your transmission. So think about those key things to keeping things moving. Um, tires and wheels and clearance. You can run any tire you want, whatever's comfortable, whatever works for you. But if the clearance isn't there for when somebody does hit you in the wheel and it bends over, obviously it's gonna create friction, it's gonna create wear and tear on that motor. Um, that motor can go a long time when stuff's free. As soon as you bind up a wheel, it's gonna take a little bit of time to put a lot of heat in that thing. So, it's the key things that you need to know your own car. Um, build based off from where, where you wanna run, build based off of where you need to be to compete. Underbuilt doesn't mean you can't win the show. Overbuilt means that you better hope that nothing goes wrong. And then that's pretty much where we stand with everything that we do. Um, as far as rear bumpers, I have no good advice for you. I try to run the factory bumper and hope it falls off at times. Other times we try to re-weld it on there once we get home and uh, refold the back end. I see guys take them off. Um, it, it's, it's pros and cons to everything. It, if the track's going slow and easy, that bumper not being on there is perfectly fine. But if it's a high speed track and somebody catches you on a 45 degree angle, you better hope it pulls that other rail or your, your car is going to dump like you wouldn't believe. Um, as far as you'll read uh, on social media, you'll see, oh, should we run a trunk or shouldn't we? Well, take that tin and throw it away. You don't have much between you and the car that hit you in the back end. Every piece of tin helps. So I hope that answered that question. But anyone got any questions? You got any tips on trying to keep the, the back of the trunk area and actually stiff, stiff it up a little bit? So, like, again, it's your rules. You have to know, like, if, let's just say I'm building a wire car and they give me eight points of contact for wire. I want to keep that trunk close to that speaker tray and close to the uh, lower trunk pan. So what I do personally is I take, um, I'll take four spots of wire to hold the trunk to the core, like I'll take the trunk to the quarters, trunk to the speaker tray, and then I'll take the trunk and speaker tray down to the lower rails. If it does not allow you to go to the rails, which nothing, in, nothing I've ever ran has been where I couldn't wire with two of my spots to the rails, they're a, a form of holding it on. If they don't allow you to do that, I, I would go to the rear um, trunk pan, you know, the upper, the lip where at the closure panel, um, just to keep that stuff tight. Um, if they allow you to, if they allow you to um, dish it at all, you know, even two inches, two inches of dish gets that stuff closer together and then tighten that wire up. Um, if they allow you in a compact, it doesn't matter what brand you're running, if they allow you two spots of wire inside that car, use it to stop the car from dumping. And a simple thing is just go to the roof, like around the rear post down to that floor. We've literally taken and blew a big hole in the floor and went to the bolt where the trailing arm hooks on and went up top or take the seat belt in the back and wrap it around the pillar post and then run your nine wire from your seat belt 
down to the floor um, or back to the other seat belt in the center. Anything you can do to hold that tin together. And what you're doing by that is you're putting the floorboard and the roof together to keep it from bellying. Seat belts in the back of a compact, they've actually made rules. You've probably read rules that say no, no seat belts except for the driver's compartment. And that rule is probably in play because of what we've done with seat belts over the years. I've taken seat belts and made cars roll in places people didn't ever, I mean, I've taken the passenger seat belt out and used it in the front frame area to hold the frames together. It's part of the car, you know what I mean? They changed that. But now they actually make it so you can't have seat belts in the back of the car because we use the back the seat belts from the factory location, not altering them to tie stuff together. So those are, those are the things you need to think about is you are just running a ball of tin. And that, a unibody vehicle is just tin spot welded together. The more compact it gets, the more edges you have on it, the harder it is. I've ran a show and what's the first thing they say when you win? You cheated, right? Everybody's been called a cheater if you've won a couple times. Is there gray areas in everybody's rule book? Yeah, I'm not sitting here gonna tell you that, oh, you need to find those. But social media has made it so that if you can't build a car nowadays, you probably are in the wrong sport because anything is out there. But you're gonna overbuild based off of pictures. And the biggest thing you need to remember is where your rules are and how you can keep that tin, in a sense, all together. And then once a car's ran a time or two, attack here or there to hold a piece of tin together will strengthen stuff so you don't need to go and get crazy and weld you know seam weld that roll in the rear trunk but once that bends and you can tack like that little two pieces of tin together just put a tack there they're not going to disqualify you for that they're not going to um, say hey you can't weld that um, that will help you out it'll let you get a couple more runs on the car possibly did you have a question Anyone else got a question? Well, you can't win without cheating. You can't win without cheating? Can. You can? I do it all the time. I don't cheat all the time. I don't cheat ever. I build to a gray area. It's not cheating. But I've built cars. I've had other people build cars that you can win with. Um, it, the biggest thing is, is you got to know on the track who, where you need to be, when you need to be there. And if it all works out, at the end you'll be there. I've taken the wildest beatings I could ever imagine on a derby track. Everyone in here has watched the video probably. Uh, derby for Alec, we had all for him racing team at a team hardcore derby. And uh, I junked a mod compact in less than three minutes. And I can tell you right now, that's a fun ride. <laughs> A little bit sore the next day, but it was fun. But that car was, I was told I was cheated. And I can tell you right now, if Jonathan Heilman uh, inspected your car, you didn't get away with nothing. So yes, you can win without cheating. Anyone else? On your front strut towers, your measurements, are you pulling it back out through that? Pull it out, push it out, whatever you gotta do. Um, you can literally put the car against a tree to get leverage to pull them. If you don't have, I have a frame machine, got, um, which helps and I do a lot with my frame machine. But if you're at home, don't even have a garage, you can pull those strut towers around with a come along by bolting a plate to it. I've even taken the strut out, turned the strut upside down, put it in the top, bolted it back up through and pulled around the strut from the top to come along those things in place. They will bend backwards, they will bend forward, they will bend in and out. It doesn't matter where they bend, know where they're at. Get a good measurement. Find the place that you're gonna be able to uh, measure from. I measure from my cage inside my car that I know didn't move to get my forward and back location because I don't measure from the bumper because the bumper's moving. As far as in and out goes, just get your measurement as long as they can be leaned this way as long as they're the same that lean and in and out that's you're gonna have to change your camber and then you're gonna have to shim your axles based on that 
and they can be bent a quarter inch or a half inch you know but know that if they're they tighten the axles up you better loosen them axles back up hello yeah um so if if they're if they're bent don't, don't just worry about bending them back just make sure that you um don't have that pressure on the axles is what i'm getting at anyone else Pressure in the subs. We've done a lot of different things with the subs. Um, again, it's your rules. I can, you can shorten your sub and, st and pressure it down and tilt your motor back um, and then still get that bolt hole. But you gotta be allowed to cut your sub uh, and then weld it back together to be able to do that. Um, if you're not allowed, or if you can take that biscuit out in the front, and make those subs and the frame come together. I know a W body, that is huge. There's, if there's no air gap there, that, that will definitely strengthen it. Um, when you weld your plates on your car, weld your plates so that it is pressuring the plates in there, definitely. Just welding a plate on a car is no good. So does that answer your question? I mean, I, we could get into this all day. You and I could talk subframes for hours and not even. Are you pushing the rails? Pushing them out? <clears throat> yep. So those rails are made to go like this, right? On impact. So we, when we build a mod car, we will pull them in. But again, you have to know your rules because if you run hard cores, then rails are not allowed to be altered. If you're, I don't know if Smash It allows you, I think that Smash It allows you to alter your rails. You can push or pull them. Um, again, we do that with the plates. I don't do that with the frame machine. I don't pull them in and re-bolt them. I get everything set stock. I put it on my frame machine, I pull it, then I'll weld the plates. Um, if you don't have those capabilities at home, a simple uh, a come along at Harbor Freight will we'll do the same thing. You, no rules say that you can't weld your frame to pull it and then grind it off. As long as that weld's not on there and that plate that you, so you can weld a plate on there, hook a chain to, and come along them two together and then weld all your stuff on, weld your bumper on, that, that will help. The other thing, back to your is the, when you're looking at the front of a car and the frame rails are straight and they're sticking out, if you tilt them like this, it's another angle, it's another edge. So you can do a lot there. Be careful on what you do though because it will bend really bad at the firewall and it will dump an axle. So they're like again, it's overbuilding. Anything else? Did I answer your question? Nothing else. And again, my name is Craig Bedell. Uh, I, I get along with everybody. I will answer your questions. Um, I will reach out and talk to me. I, I got nothing to hide. I'll bring you to my shop and show you my cars. I'll let you go through them. These guys know. I, I mean, I'm not to keep coming back to these guys, but I met these guys through Derby and I've answered every question they've ever had. I've told them things that have cost me thousands thousands of dollars to figure out. Yes, sir. What's that? What's your preference for do's or don'ts with automatics to the five speed? What is your preference for five speed or automatic? So, <laughs> I, per, I, I don't have a preference. The reason I don't run a five-speed car anymore is I broke my hip a long time ago. So to hold myself in the car the way you need to to run a five-speed, I can't do. Um, is it better? Absolutely. If you have a Kevlar clutch and you are grabbing gears out there, you are going to be able to destroy some people's cars in a hurry. If you can drive that car. If your feet come off that pedal and you can't hold yourself in that car, a guy with an automatic is going to win. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Is there any W body questions that I may not or may know?
because a W body is a whole different animal than a Camry. Camrys are basic. A W body, you can make that thing bend junk in about three seconds, or you can make it really strong. Um, as far as a Honda goes, we won't even get into those things. <laughs> I would hate to be a tech inspector, that's all I can say. Um, let's touch on the wiring harness real quick. So social media has given us this wiring harness simplification thing where people try to duplicate it. You can go on YouTube, you can build your own. Do what works for you. If you found something that's working, it starts your car, that's fine. Don't copy everything else that everyone's doing. There's people out there that are building wiring harnesses and making it so you gotta buy this computer. There's people that are building it simple and there's people that are building it complicated. Both work, one's cool, and one's not. I'm not going to get into discussing with you whether that guy's doing it the right way and that guy's not because they both will win. They both will work. But just because it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for that next guy. Because if a loose ground cable on your battery on any compact is happening or it rained and you don't have a proper ground, you go on that derby track, it will fry that computer. See it every derby. You. You basically have to make sure that your wiring harness in a compact or even if you're running a full-size car, doesn't matter what kind of car you have, the computers can't handle a faulty ground. And if you don't have a good ground, it will arc. And where does it arc? It goes to the motherboard. Happens all the time. When it's wet out, the biggest thing I'm going to tell you to do is cover your computer cover your wiring harness because even if you have open wiring which I don't run switches I'm not I'm not gonna tell you that that's the right way it's probably the wrong way uh, if that wiring's wet and you arc it and it back feeds I've personally burned up more wiring harness than w wiring harnesses than most people have ever used and it all comes down to faulty ground or wet wiring them are bad no-nos. Um, fuel, fuel systems. Do not leave your fuel in your car over the winter and expect to go win a derby. Those fuel injectors, I don't know if anyone's ever tore a fuel injector apart, but they are the finest little pinholes that will get clogged up with any kind of substance. It doesn't matter if that um, fuel, if that fuel has ethanol in it that you're running, which most people do. It's just a compact, right? We're going to buy whatever gas. We're going to use whatever we can siphon out of the lawnmower. It doesn't matter, right? When you go to fire that car up and it starts running cruddy, nine times out of ten, it's because you've got the wrong fuel in there. That fuel is plugging up your injectors. Everything that I run, whether that car had 80,000 miles or 150,000 miles, when I build that derby car, my fuel tank that I'm putting in that car has good fuel in it. Ethanol free doesn't have to happen. But if you're going to run ethanol fuel, know that if it sits all winter long, it's going to do the same thing your lawnmower does. It's not going to start. You're asking it to perform when it's not going to. Clean your fuel system. Run good fuel. They're major things. Um, I run overpriced fuel. It doesn't, it's not what wins the derby. I'm just telling you to keep good, clean fuel in your car. Octane booster, it, it will help. Um, if you're going to leave your fuel in your car for the winter, make sure you put stable in it. Anyone else? Ran into a lot of bounce, dropping and stuff. The what? The bounce in the head. So, yeah, so if you get a, uh, you're talking about a Camry. So a Camry, if you get a four-cylinder Camry hot, it will stick a valve. It's usually one of the center cylinders. Um, you can simply just spray them up. 
right? Is that your the center cylinder you're having a problem with? Yeah. Um, this is caused because it's too much heat, and um, it's like anything. It's a mechanical piece that's not designed to get that hot. So what happens is, is the seat just welds right to it. So I spray them with WD-40. Don't be afraid to take your header off and spray it with WD. Um, I've had to take pliers in there and a chisel and it, yeah, it, 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 it's fine. As long as you get it moving again. Um, but yeah, I've, I've actually personally thrown motors out because I thought they were junk and that's all it was, it was a stupid stuck valve. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of that too is, it's your maintenance. When you got done running that derby, you took that car home, oh, it got hot, I'll worry about it tomorrow, right? When I take that car home, first thing I do is spray them things up or tarp my motor because water getting in your header will cause that same thing. You get a little rust on that valve stem, uh, it, you're driving that rust up into a seat and it's bound to weld itself up in there, especially if it was distorted during that heat. So yeah, just take care, prep your engines. When you get home, before you run it, you know, the first thing I see people do is cut a fancy hole in the hood, put a nice header on, pull it out in the yard. Absolutely not. Not a car, there's not a car in my yard that has a header on it sitting out in the yard, not tarped or properly taken care of. Five gallon pail at the store on the hood and a tarp over it will save you a lot of problems. It's just, it's just basic things. And the small things are what will win you a derby. Is there anything else? Um, so we build steel wheels for the back and I try to run those all the time. I build lightweight ones. I am not the guy that you want to ask about running that payloader tire or that fork truck tire. If that thing is heavier than pretty much what goes from the factory, the bearing can't take it. Why would the spindle? I always see people dragging the rear spindles around. I literally will run a donut tire, $20 at a junkyard, no matter where you live in the country. Crazy money for a donut, right? But them donut tires didn't make that guy drag his spindle around. And when that tin locks around there, you can still skid that around. When you're skidding that, um, 30 pound hub around with nothing attached to it and then it back you back up and it digs in you're vulnerable to get your wheels taken out in the front biggest thing you got to keep these cars rolling these cars rolling will obviously keep the motor from overheating keep your transmission in the car um, it's pretty basic but I would try I would strongly suggest building a set of wheels for the back or having somebody build a nice set of lightweight wheels and a good trick is if you have Amish in your community the Amish build wheelbarrow tires and these wheelbarrow tires have a steel ring and you can get them in 14 and 15 inch sizes and then you can take a donut tire off the rim cut the rim down which you can do with a torch or anything, just because it doesn't have to hold air, slide it together, put that Amish wheel, wheelbarrow ring on there, tack it in a couple places, put the backpack on the rim, tack it, and I, you just finish tacking it around, now you got a solid rim and tire. Thing weighs less than the donut. And anyone who wants to look at them can see them right on, you go to my Facebook page and look at my last derby car. They're, they're right there. People have already taken pictures of them. We've been doing those. We've been running those for years. Um, it's, just, it's just what we do that works for us. I'm not going to say that's the best thing out there. They do drive real funny when you do that because this back end slides all over the place. But it's what we like. Anything else? Nothing? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll be around all day today. I'll, and I'm, like I said, anyone's got any questions, I'm around all the time. Be more than happy to answer a question. Hopefully I can help you out. And uh, everybody stay safe and have fun. Keep the sport going. Thank you.